everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations, where we talk about mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. And join me in this week's heartfelt episode where I welcome the insightful Luke Entrope, and we have a profound conversation exploring the often overlooked topic of rites of passage for adolescent boys. Luke, who is a devoted father and advocate for intentional parenting, shares his personal journey in initiating his own son into the realm of adulthood. As our discussion unfolds, Luke and I delve into the significance of rites of passage, shedding light on the transformative impact they can have on a young person's life. And our conversation touches upon the challenges of modern parenting and the importance of creating intentional, meaningful experiences to guide adolescents through this crucial phase of self-discovery. Luke is a leadership and men's coach. He is the founder of the Father-Son Connection Experience, which is a rite of passage event for boys and their father figures. This retreat is for boys 10 to 14 and marks the passage from childhood into adolescence. Luke also supports men to live lives of deeper impact through coaching and training. You can find him online at www.lukeentrup.com. And please leave a review or a comment in the comment section at the end of the episode. I would truly appreciate it. Brief word for our sponsors. So I would like to talk about deodorants because I'm tired of constantly replenishing my deodorant and then having to worry about disposing those plastic containers. There's a solution for that. Wild. Wild provides a eco-friendly, all-natural deodorant with a sustainable design. They provide a for life aluminum case. For me, they sent me a personalized case with my name on it. And did I mention you can customize your orders and have these refills delivered straight to your door? This is an all natural solution where there's no aluminum in the product, just in the case. Go to wearewild.com and use code EASY at checkout for 25% off your first order. Luke, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. And I'm really excited for our conversation. Uh, It's been good to connect with you previously, but uh, we'll jump into quite a bit of depth today, hopefully. But uh, before we get going, I do want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself uh, to the listeners and let us know a little bit about what it is that you do. Great. Yeah. Thrilled to be here. Uh, love what you're up to. So yeah, happy to share just a little bit about my work. I uh, am an executive coach by day. And then uh, when I'm not coaching CEOs around leadership and culture, I lead rites of passage work. And I help uh, I help fathers and sons connect more deeply through experiences in the wilderness and in some group retreats. And really focused on this idea of um, helping adol- adol- boys kind of transition from childhood into adolescence and really making that shift in a way that's intentional and with a lot of depth, setting them up to to uh, essentially be good men. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's amazing and, and much needed in today's world. And I do want to jump into that a little bit further and explore what that looks like. Um, I've covered rites of passages in the past here, but not specifically when it comes to to boys or, or our sons. So that'll be definitely an interesting take. But I am curious about the executive work you do, because I mean, that's not something that's very common. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also feel that's something needed because I've worked in the corporate world for 16 years and I see a lot of the, I, I've had various leaders, um, as you can appreciate over the years, and 
sometimes I question the leadership. So what are you helping these leaders with, uh, in terms of the work you do? Yeah, well, I work, so I work in mostly with companies that are growing very quickly and helping them scale their leadership capabilities, their culture. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm there to help a very specific problem of growing pains. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people that start companies, they have this really great idea. They have some sort of offering, but they've never actually, uh, led people. <laughs> they've never actually built an organization. They have some sort of great idea, but they don't know how do I inspire people to, to follow me on this journey? How do I get the most out of the people that are, that I've, you know, that are working on the project with me? So we really focus on the leadership aspect of motivation, engagement, um, getting the right, the right group in place, the right team. And so I coach mostly on that, but then also just the internal landscape of being a leader. It's, it's, it's lonely at the top, right? To be a CEO of a company, there's no one, it, it all comes back to you. And so what is the, uh, you know, kind of the balance there and the, and the, the mental game of being a CEO and the emotional game of the CEO? If you want to find out uh, where some of your blind spots live, go found a company at, and, and then you will get to see all of your, <laughs> your shortcomings play out across your organization, right? Mm -hmm. And so in, my, in my opinion, there's a few ways if we really, really want to grow as a human and grow and evolve you know, to the best version of ourselves, uh, go either start a company because you will see it there, get in a relationship yeah. or become a parent, right? These are the crucibles of growth of human evolution and, and kind of self-development. So um, it's a, when you're, when you've got, you know, hundreds of people looking up to you and uh, you will start to see your brilliance and your shortcomings rather quickly. And it's helpful just to have a guide with that journey. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's so important what you touched on there, that internal landscape, because I find often that goes amiss. Uh, often the, the leaders aren't really paying attention to that and off, you know, they'll take it for granted and like very much similar to as individuals, what we go through when we're not paying attention to that internal world, we will just keep bottling up and then it shows up in the most unfortunate circumstances or catches us off guard and because we haven't been paying attention to it right or we haven't built the skills to be able to deal with it and and i think that is a, very much crucial based on what i've observed and my experiences with leadership as well in in corporations or or startups for that matter yeah and i think you know leadership is one of these things that anybody can do it there's no it's a myth to think there's the right way to be a leader or the right way to be CEO. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work is just uncovering what's the way that I want to lead and what are, what are my gifts and skills and where are my blind spots so that I can bring in some people to support me in my areas that I'm not so strong. And that's a lot of, you know, what really good leaders do is they figure out where their strengths are and they play to their strengths and they build a really great team around them to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And coming back to like that whole internal world, rites of passage, right? So just trying to understand why do you think it's so crucial for us to be able to guide adolescents, right? Like, uh, or boys that are entering that adolescent phase of their lives. Um, I mean, I have my own views on that too, but I uh, want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, I think it's it's actually baked into our DNA. I think it's it's a pretty ancient thing yes. in all humans, right? There is this need to have to make meaning out of large transitions in our lives, right? Like we celebrate birth here, and we celebrate you know new life, and there's a lot of ritual and there's a lot of um, community focus on that. We mostly, I wouldn't say celebrate death, but we acknowledge it. We have these rituals to say end of life, look back on someone's life and honor them. Um, we don't do such a great job of the other big transitions in life. And one of them is when a child's body starts changing, puberty kicks in, they start to become an adolescent and things change. And 
you know, this stage of life is all about a sense of belonging. It's a sense of finding some mastery in one's body, whether it's through sports or music or art, getting really good at something and feeling part of a tribe. This goes way, 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 way back. And so we need this. We are highly social creatures. We need these intentional honorings of passing from one stage to the next. And if that doesn't happen, we will start looking for it and we will look for it in all the wrong places. So the idea is how do we create a sense of belonging and um, this, this kind of ceremonial demarcation of passing from childhood into adolescence in a way that offers some guidance, some mentorship. And in my case, I've really focused on how do we do a rite of passage from you know, childhood into a- adolescence while strengthening the bond in this case, between father and son, or father figure mm-hmm. and and the boys, um, yeah. so th- that's my view generally on rites of passage. There's other rites of passage throughout the lifetime, right? There's of course there's actually a, a much more important one a little later, the entering into adulthood. Be, you know, this like kind of seventeen to twenty year old rite of passage, and we see you know you look into the culture, you see all sorts of <laughs> impact. If that's not done well. What can happen there where people are really trying to prove their, you know, in, in this case, prove their manhood, prove that they belong. Um, and there's other ones, you know, there's marriage and there's other or, you know, relationships and, and other ones throughout the lifetime. But um, these early ones are really important because if we can cultivate a, a sense of feeling out beyond just the self-centered way of being into the community and into those around us, our family, our loved ones, the place we live. At an early age, we develop um, the capacity to, you know, show up in a different way and, and hopefully contribute to our communities in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you touched on the idea of what happens if it's not done properly. And I think we've lost sight of that as a society, to, to your point earlier as well ancient civilizations put a lot of emphasis on that whereas we don't have that today and some of the negative consequences you see is boys are often feeling isolated they even feel shame with some of the bodily changes you were referring to and that could be a very lonely place and you see a lot of boys struggle with that Uh, what are your thoughts with respect to that and why do you feel like we've lost that over time Yeah, it's a great question. The why? Um, I mean, let's look at some cultures that that you know have maintained it throughout time, Mm -hmm. right? So we think about some of the sub-Saharan African cultures of the the warrior cultures, where you know they will go out and they they you know go out until you kill a lion, right? And you may or you may not come back, and and um, that is quite an initiation into manhood, right? Um, And while that seems a bit uh, wild to uh, the Western culture, there's something really ancient and very important about that, the facing of one's own mortality and the sense of, um, of, of just a radical sense of, uh, I was a boy and now I'm a man. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, why do we not do this anymore? Why do we not uh, face discomfort, face hard things? Why do we not uh, separate from the comforts of home and go out into the wilderness anymore? Um, Yeah, I mean, part of it is probably just the way that this culture is set up around productivity and isolation. And, um, you know, I think it's a, there's been a general eroding of, of, you know, what we, what um, social science researchers call social capital, right? This idea that we're spending a lot of, when we spend more time together, just in general community, um, we start to, there's like a deeper fabric between people and that has eroded over time. And mm-hmm. so I, I don't think this is an intractable problem. I think this is a problem that I imagine in a couple hundred years, if we keep at this, we keep bringing these ceremonial rites of passage back and we keep pushing back against the forces of isolation, we can turn the, we can turn the tides, right? And so this is part of, you know, I think all of our work is to, to 
look beyond the superficiality of our culture and really commit to deep, meaningful connections with those around us, whether it's our children and going out in the wilderness with our children, or whether it's our neighbor or um, you know people in our community, it's, it's uh, totally possible to turn, turn the tide on this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and a couple of things I've observed, and, and you know, to your point in the, the, the African wilderness, as you alluded to, I mean, there, that's looked upon as almost too extreme. And it's like, why, are you, why do we put boys through that? And w- what I've observed is often if boys aren't given the opportunity to health, like in a healthy way, have that role modeling done to channel that aggression, it keeps showing up in unhealthy ways uh, when they grow older. And, and that's something I think you made reference to earlier, especially when they start entering the latter teenage years or early 20s. And you see a lot of those problematic behaviors because they haven't learned how to channel that aggression, as I said. And the other thing I find fascinating is, like, I remember growing up, I used to spend, especially in the summers, my entire day outside playing sports or whatever it was. And you don't see that anymore with kids. And even the families I work with, They have like, they're so consumed by how to keep their kids occupied when they're off school. And it's like, I was having this conversation with a family last week and I was like, well, I remember growing up, I'd be outside and I'd come, I'd leave in the morning, I'd come home to eat, go back, come back again to eat dinner. And that was it. And my parents never really had to worry, oh, what are we going to do with them in the summer? And, um, nor was I stuck in the basement playing video games. So. There's been a huge shift, and I think a lot of the problems we see are arising from that, at least from my perspective. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, this concept of free-range kids, right? Like, we, we, we must bring this back. We must uh, create enough safety for our kids to play freely, but also, you know, be willing to, to uh, relax the helicopter parenting a bit, um, yeah. which is, you know, understandable, but um, a necessary part. There's also this piece, right? Like we are a culture that is largely led and run by uninitiated men, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you look at just the Western culture, rites of passage have been gone long enough that there are all of these boyish men that do, that have not faced their own heart and mind in a very um, deep way, that have not had mentoring about what it means to be a man of integrity, a man of accountability, a man that is both connected to his sense of purpose and power, not power over, but just feeling a sense of power, while also having a sense, uh, um, a sense of uh, sensitivity, right? Like knowing his impact on those around him. Right. And th- so what we have is just a, a fail. Uh, the, the chain was broken, right? The chain of passing down what it means to be uh, you know, a man living from a place of, of healthy masculinity. And so that's really, I think we're in a moment where uh, we need to redefine that for our time. And um, we, need to, we need to reestablish that chain. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I find often when we overprotect boys, then when they get out into the real world and when reality really hits, um, and you face adversity for the first time, they don't know how to handle it. Uh, they're just confused, lost, and often can't even handle that pressure. And I think it's important to cultivate some of those things early on. Now, with the work you're doing, what are some of the things that you focus on? And if you don't mind walking us through, what does that rite of passage look like for, for the boys or families you're working with? Yeah. Yeah. Happy to share. I mean, l- let me just make, I- I'd love to make just one more point, follow up on a key point that you make, right? And it's this idea of discomfort. Really? Um, we have become very comfortable yeah. <laughs> behind these, these homes in these, uh, you know, in these cities and suburban areas. And there's just, there's a modern civilization Um, has removed us from the need to face hard things and to dig a little deeper, right? And so when when you're talking about this kind of 
collapse that happens in boys and young men when they face something hard, that is something that can be uh, cultivated, a sense of fortitude, a sense of stick with itness. And how we do that is by doing hard things. It's by being in discomfort. And there's some really cool stuff we can do around that, right? With, with, so I work a lot with the 10 to 14 year olds, mm -hmm. boys and their fathers or father figures, right? And so we'll do things like just light martial arts, right? Just light warrior training. We'll do things like jump in a cold water and we'll work up to that by doing things like holding an ice cube for two minutes. I don't know if you've ever done this, but it, it, I actually learned this through the birthing class with when my, um, uh, my co-parent, she, when she was pregnant with our son, uh, they taught her grab an ice cube and hold it. Right. And you, it'll, it burns. It gets really, it's painful, right? And so how do you work with the pain of something that cold? You relax around it. You deep, you breathe deeply. You don't fixate on it. There's like, you, you create a sense of spaciousness in your mind and in your body. This is great warrior training for like a 12 year old boy, right? Hold an ice cube for two minutes and just see what your mind does and right. be there. And this is, this is the key ingredient to a rite of passage, right? have mentorship, have eldership right there with you every step of the way. So as it's getting hard, get some coaching, whether it's from your dad or for somebody else around like, all right, you can do this, breathe, you're going to stick with it. So then they've done that and then they're ready to just jump into a, you know, a 40 degree mountain stream yeah. and have a swimming party in the, in the, in the stream. Right. And they, they, you know, so that's an example of, cultivating a sense of solid spine, like having a backbone of being able to do something hard. Mm -hmm. um, and at times that means like pushing through discomfort. And at times it means like listening to your body. But I think today, you know, the day, the, the era we live in, it's much more about pushing through and doing hard things than backing off. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's that resistance, right? Often people will be like, well, why are you pushing this kid so hard? And this is not right. And yeah. And I struggle with that. I mean, I've taken my son on hikes. We'll, we'll go out to the mountains and sometimes he'll just stop. Like the last time we went, he's had like two or three moments where he's like, I can't do this anymore. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, we'll wait here. Uh, we were with a group. We're not going back down. We're just going to wait. And then after a couple minutes, he reevaluates. He's like, all right, let's keep going. And then when he finished the hike, he was just so happy that he did it. Right. And I mean, there was a little bit of pushing from my end too, but it's just having that experience can be so crucial for, for boys because it's not only that physical barrier they're able to push past. It's mostly that mental mm -hmm. aspect. Cause I mean, a couple of times I'm like, you've done the hardest part already. And we're like more than halfway through. I'm trying to understand like, what's your resistance right now? And he had no answer for that. So he's like, all right, let's keep moving. Right. And it was that mental barrier that, uh, he needed to overcome, but we need more of those experiences because otherwise they don't know what they're capable of. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well said. And I think best done, like if we're going to push someone up against an edge to, to help them move through some, find some like kind of deeper gear inside of themselves around fortitude and persistence best done to teach that in combination with emotional awareness. Like what are the emotions that are arising in my body right now? Am I feeling sad or am I afraid? Am I angry? What's help helping to name and identify and understand the, the intelligence, the information that's beneath the emotion? Um, will help navigate those situations like you described with your son that we've all been in as parents when the, you know, the kid just like sits down and says, I'm not doing it or I can't do it. Yeah. To take a moment and pause and say, okay, what's happening? Are you, you know, are you scared right now? Or are you, are you physically tired? Help to unpack what's where it's coming from so that you can, you know, you can meet that moment. We don't want to just blindly push through, right? We want to cultivate a sense of self-awareness in these moments. And, you know, one of the, one of the concepts that I often teach to the, to the 
boys and their dads that I work with is one eye out, one eye in. Mm. So I'm tracking the world around me. I'm, I'm aware of the path in front of me. I'm aware of the people. I'm super present to the room, but I also am tracking one eye in what's occurring. Do I have butterflies in my belly right now? Mm. Am I starting to feel like a sense of heat in my body? Like I'm getting a bit angry. Am I really enjoying this and feeling peace or my shoulders relaxed, tracking the body, tracking the emotions? Um, Because there's, there's a, there's a thing about just blindly pushing through. We don't want to override ourselves as well. We want to be in integrity with um, our internal landscape as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I agree. It's that piece is so important because, you know, I notice it with myself too. You, you kind of run on autopilot without really checking in with yourself. And, you know, the whole aspect of finding stillness is, is important for me, but teaching that early on, cause I wasn't taught those skills. I have to learn them later on in life when it becomes a bit harder and sometimes you have no choice, but how can you cultivate that within kids early on? And it's so important to have that check in with yourself internally when, whenever you're doing something, it doesn't always have to be something physical or hard could be in your day to day life. Um, like even like taking a pause between tasks at work and that's something we don't learn but so important yeah. absolutely yeah to find those rhythms the inhale the exhale the pauses i mean and there's there's something else that happens right once we start to cultivate that self awareness around what's happening inside of us we're much uh more in tuned with our impact on others <laughs> and think about being a you know like a four, 13 14 year old boy and how much there's kind of a messiness about them, right? The way they move through the world. And so the one I in also helps us b- begin to develop empathy and sensitivity about other people's boundaries. So this is one of the things we'll do in the program is work a lot around boundaries, spatial boundaries, physical boundaries, um, doing a game of like uh, with your dad, come closer with a, with a hand signal, come closer, closer. We'll, we'll line them up in two lines, right? Come closer. Okay, now pause and now move back. So physically moving and, and calling and moving dads back and forth and pausing to play around with boundaries. How close is too close? Mm. Let me be in control of my own boundaries of how you come at me. And um, what we're doing there is fundamentally, in my opinion, we're teaching consent, right? Yeah. We're teaching a way of honoring by, by me being in control, complete control of my boundaries and how close my dad or my father figure gets to me, I'm starting to understand the concept of yes, no, maybe, you know, slow down, speed up. So it's, we're teaching this idea of physical consent um, in that way as well. So self-awareness leads to actual, you know, sensitivity to, and empathy towards others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, again, a great point. So, you know, you've touched on a few aspects of this rites of passage, starting with like combat sports or, or martial arts. And then you've talked about doing some of the hard things, uh, exposure to cold, which is a great thing to learn <laughs> early mm-hmm. on. And, and then you've talked about the boundary setting and, and understanding what feels right, what doesn't feel right. So by the end of these, re- I'm assuming these are retreats or... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So by, by the end of these retreats, what are the boys coming out with and what are they telling you they, they've gotten out of those experiences? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the program's called the Father-Son Connection Experience, right? And so it's really, it's centered around these two elements of rite of passage. So um, we do a ceremony on the last night that marks their passage from childhood into adolescence where they're honored and around a fire in front of the rest of the community and the other dads and boys and their, their, um, their dad and, and those of us that lead the retreat really take a moment to celebrate each individual boy's passage. So they, they leave feeling, uh, you know, like they've made that journey, like they're now on the path to being a teenager. Um, we, and so that's the first element. The second element is the connection with the father figure. So we send them out in uh, on walks in the woods, in the forest, in the mountains, wherever we're doing them. 
we send them out for usually about 90 minutes a day to have one-on-one walks with dad. And, you know, sometimes we send them out with questions. Sometimes we send them out to go collect a treasure. Um, sometimes we send them out to just notice what they notice, but they've got time outside together. And then we do, we do a lot of work with the boys around. So at this stage, it's really about, you know, if we, if we look at the psychological kind of terminology, it's all about healthy ego development, ego, right. meaning like our sense of self, who, are, who am I, who am I becoming? Right. Um, there's this great, there's this great uh, philosopher, uh, Ken Wilber talks about in order to transcend yourself, you must first have a self, right? And so this stage is all about self-development. Who am I going to be in the world? Who am I becoming? And so we do a lot about what are my gifts to the world? What type of man do I want to become? And then what are my doubts? What gets in the way? And so we do some group work around that, that is, includes some emotional kind of healing, emotional awareness. That's, that's all done kind of inside. And then we do what we call our warrior training. So there's this concept of what does it mean to be a warrior? If you're becoming a warrior, what are the tenets of being a warrior? And that's some of the movement. That's the cold exposure. That's um, some gains. We do a lot of games. And so they leave with this sense of like, being on the path of warriorship, warriorship, meaning again, like one eye out, one eye in facing difficult things, being a stand for integrity, being a stand for becoming a good man. And, um, so, you know, we've heard from some of the boys, like, uh, I heard this very funny comment from one of the moms actually last week. She said, he has said to me that now he is a a young warrior in training and that he should be able to have more freedom. <laughs> yeah. So but it's funny, but it also kind of points to the stage they're in, right? Which is like, they're starting to break free of the nest and wanting a bit more liberty and feeling a bit more anchored in their own being and feeling a bit more independent while at the same time, hopefully way more connected to dad or the father figure. Mm-hmm. Knowing that, it's inevitable they need to push off from their father figure and their mother. That's coming. But when things get really hard, we hope that they will turn to dad in those moments, at least. Um, one other element that we do on the last day, we do a whole thing around puberty, sex, consent. We have a certified sex educator that comes and spends an hour or two just talking very basic, uh, you know, just very basic kind of anatomy, sex ed. And then we do a Q&A where all the boys and dads anonymously write questions on a card and there's a kind of a open discussion or a, a, you know, they're answered by the sex educator mm-hmm. and then they go off with their dad for an hour and a half. So it's what we heard from the dads in this piece was like, Oh my gosh, thank you. You've given us a runway to now have these conversations that I wasn't sure how to open this up with right. him. And now it's wide open and we can talk about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, so it's just a, we're not trying to do a comprehensive sex ed, but we want to open up the conversation so that the big important questions get answered. And again, hopefully dad is there in those moments when something bigger does arise. So that's, right. that's it in a nutshell. That's the program. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for breaking it all that down uh, and, and walking us through that. And I think that last part is again, very important because often Dads don't know where to start. They're either waiting for the kid to initiate it. Kid doesn't know where to start. So it's good that you break the ice and from that perspective and, and just have that healthy dialogue where it's not awkward and, and we can just be real about it. And one of the other things I wanted to explore further was because that warriorship aspect is, is so important. One of the things I find people in general, men and boys, in today's world, lack is this sense of discipline. And I think teaching them that early on also is, is important, right? You're learning that movement and all of that, but it comes with the responsibility. And then there's that added level of discipline and holding yourself accountable and not always falling to your temptations or, or just those instantly gratifying choices, right? So is there a bit of emphasis on that or is it kind of implied? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, the way that I generally treat discipline at this age is focus more on the persistence part and less on the, less on the, like, um, like we're not doing something, when I work with older clients, like my CEO clients, I will, when I, when we talk about discipline, I will work on smart goals and setting up very clear agreements and making sure there's integrity in my agreements. Like I feel good about, I'm going to commit to whatever, going to the gym three times a week for two weeks. It's very clear. Either I did it or I didn't. Mm -hmm. And before I commit to that, I want to make sure that I feel like I can do 100% can do that. And I'm not going to set myself up for failure. I'm not going to commit to go to the gym three times a week for the next year. I'll do it for two weeks. It'll be done. Check. It's done or it's not. And then I'll make my next commitment. That's in my mind, that's discipline. That's smart goals. There's a great book out that's been out for a couple of years now that I think does this very well called Atomic Habits. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it for creating that momentum in your life around making positive, um, positive, you know, action essentially. Yeah, At this age, 10 to 14, I, I haven't found that to be super helpful or particularly useful model. I think that the more important thing is doing the thing about facing hard things, right? Like getting in cold water. It's about, it's about, um, maybe getting up a little earlier than we want to. It's about, um, you know, committing to being out on an hour and a half hike rather than just coming in when we're done. And, um, that riding that edge of needing to, to dig a little deeper and find out what, whether I have it or not. And where I do, when I do realize I have it, knowing that, um, that I can build on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I took my boy backpacking, just him and I last year, and it was a very long hike. And, um, you know, there were some moments where he was like, Oh my gosh, I don't think I could do it. And we had to pause. And this was, we were out for several, several days, right out in the, in the back country in the wilderness. And, um, you know, anyway, we made it through yeah. and, you know, a month later, he's wondering, when can we go again? When can we go again? When can we go again? And we just, you know, I'm just coming out of the back country again a week ago, and it was a much different experience. And in my mind, that's discipline. It's like okay. building that muscle of like, I don't think I can do this. Oh, actually, I did it. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want more. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, and that, that makes complete sense too. And And the other thing I wanted to touch on is how important this is because of the bonding opportunity the the father or father figure gets with the son and vice versa, right? And we don't create those opportunities a lot in our day-to-day -day lives. So it, it's a great opportunity for both. And I think for fathers as well, who are trying to figure out how to be an active part in their, their son's lives or, or finding things to, or fi trying to figure out what we can do. These are great opportunities just to get out. And some of the things we've already talked about, but role modeling for your son and at the same time having those opportunities where this the child also realizes that okay there are going to be tough things but i can always turn to my father and and we don't have that in society today uh to a larger extent yeah so there's right so i think that one uh, this is a belief i hold mm -hmm. one of the greatest gifts i can offer my children as their father is to pull them out of their everyday myopic uh, existence, the, the ruts we get in, the narrow places in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. My, one of my most important jobs is to take them on adventures, to snap them out, show them new things. You know, this is the, like the Dalai Lama talks about, if you wanna like walk a path of peace, visit one new place every year. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like this idea that when we start, and it doesn't mean you have to go on these big, long trips, although that is great if you can do it. It just means getting out of, go to one new place where people look at the world slightly differently, even if it's like across a state line or, you know, go, you know, drive a hundred miles or something or go to a park. Um, but my job is, as father is to help provide those experiences. Right. And so 
whether that's a rite of passage experience or taking them camping or taking them, you know, on a trip or whatever it is, is to cultivate, to uh, foster a sense of wonderment and awe, connection to something greater than themselves, ideally in the natural world. There's so much about that that um, will really shape the way they experience the world and other people and people that are different than them and um, makes them more flexible mentally and emotionally and more creative. So I've, I've really view that as like one of my most important jobs. As part of that, there's like some really beautiful bonding that happens, yeah. right? Like when you're <laughs> when you're in the middle of the mountain. So last week I was in the middle of the Eastern Sierras with my boy. He's 12 years old. And this lightning storm came and we were up pretty high and there's lightning strikes everywhere. So we found a cluster of small trees. I got to teach him all about like lightning safety. <laughs> and yeah. we're huddled and we're like under our rain gear, it's pouring rain, lightning everywhere. He's freaked out. He's never really seen a storm like that. And like, that's a bonding experience. He will probably never forget that. I don't know if I will either. We made it out safe and sound, but it's like, those are the things. And there's like a sense of wonderment and awe. Like, you know, he's, he's like, I didn't know thunder could be so loud. Yeah. I didn't know lightning felt like that when it's so close. And yeah. there's a thing, there's a, uh, humility and a humbleness that happens when we face the power of the natural world like that, that I think really opens one's eyes. Yeah. And for sure. And, and also they're learning life skills that they wouldn't learn otherwise. Right. And, um, it just, you, your perspective changes, you realize that the world's such a big place. Um, and the biggest thing in today's world is just, you, the more you can get them away from screens, the better. Like I find like the conversations I have with my son are on a different level when we're out on these adventures. Uh, we really get to talk. And unfortunately, outside of that, we don't typically, right? It's it's very um, simple. And, and then we both get buried in some of the things we're doing or busy with. But those are really good opportunities for us to get out and away from the day to day. And bond as you said and and have deep conversations and i get to learn so much about the things he's thinking about and uh that's going on in his head yeah yeah exactly yeah no no doubt yeah we you know there's obviously a place for screens and and uh, but it's something i think we all struggle with is like how do we how do we not let them get between us and our children and how do we uh, help our children have um exercise that muscle of focus. I think the screens really um, create a lot of distraction. But yeah. um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, though, which is like on this program, you talked about the father-son bond. We talked a lot about that. There's this other really amazing thing that happens, which is the fathers connecting with the other fathers, yeah, yeah. right? Like there's this thing about when men get together kind of in the wild and we we when when everybody arrives by the way we put away our phones we collect everybody's phones and say here they are if you need them but like screen free event so um we detox from the screens and we do some of the warrior training is just the boys with 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 me basically and then some of my my compatriots my uh the people that i that help me with the program that have created it with me they take the men off and circle up around a fire and talk about What's it like to be a father in today's world? And what are some challenges you're having with, you know, this age? And what's your own growth about how you can show up as a better father? Yeah. Where, are you, where are your blind spots getting in the way? Where is your distractibility having you show up as less than the father that you wanted to be? Because we all have this. I think one of the main experiences I've had as a parent is... I'm not anything like the parent I thought I would be. There's a massive gap between who I thought I would be and who I actually am. And I think yeah. that's, that's just like inherent in being a parent, right? So, but how do we work on closing that gap? And um, best done, I think, around so, some of these topics, best done in a circle of men who are trustworthy and right. committed to the same inquiry. Yeah, and it goes back to what you touched on earlier, that whole sense of belonging and connection not only for the boys, but for the men as well. And the biggest thing I've realized, even through the, the men's groups I'm a part of is we don't have to do this alone. We can learn from each other's experiences. We can uh, support each other through the challenging times or, or even the tough questions we may have. 
but it comes back to that whole sense of community that again, I feel like is lacking at times. And, and that's a great opportunity for the fathers to just connect and learn that maybe it's not so bad, right? I'm not the only one perhaps going through this. So that's a great opportunity too. Yeah. There's, there's an element of support, right? Like there's a, as you're saying, like it's, a, there's like a common experience, um, uh, that I think is really helpful. There's also an element of challenge, right? Like the, the, um, I love this, this author, David Data, he writes a lot about men's psychology and men's particularly around like intimacy and sex, right? He has this idea. He has this concept that I love, which he says the feminine, and this could be women or just the feminine in each of us grows best through praise. The masculine in, in each of us grows best through challenge, right? So I think about the times when I have like been called to the carpet by a brother who really cares about me and sees some part of me about my shadow, my, my blind spot, how that's showing up, whether it's me as a parent or as a partner or as just a friend. And he calls that out of me and says, deeper brother, you can do better. Mm. You know, um, those deep, compassionate cuts, that challenge, those have been some of the biggest gifts I've ever received. Right. So that's the other element is like the little bit of like, um, you know, it can be a bit of, a, um, a cauldron of growth, right? Like where yeah. it's the, this, the seat can get a little hot sometimes with really good men's circles. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I, that's something we don't do much. We, in, in just everyday life. So it's something I've had to really create for myself and, Part of what we're doing, we're doing a light version of that in this particular program, but I would just say in general, I think it's really good for men to find a circle to be in where they can both be supported and challenged. Yeah. Yeah. And, and getting that honest feedback, which is so rare, um, and, and surrounding ourselves with people who are willing to give that feedback and also receive it in return is, is always a gift. Um, but thank you, Luke. Um, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing this rites of passage initiative with us and walking us through what it looks like. And like I said, many times it, it's so crucial in today's world, especially with boys. And, and I think it's our responsibility as fathers to take care of that for them and, and show them the way at times. But, um, if, is there anything else you feel like we may have not talked about and is valuable for the listeners to hear? Just one other point. Um, you like, Obviously, if someone's called, please come join us at the program. The, the website's fathersonconnection.com. We'd love to have you. Um, I also have my own podcast, Crazy Wisdom. You can go listen to that. Here's my last point, though. Um, if, if you're not able to join us, just like you can do this. You know, it doesn't take much to take your son or your children on a car camping trip and leave the phone in the car and go have that deep connection, right? That, that look, getting the look, the eye to eye look around a fire or under the stars, those mo those super sweet moments that that is what kids want more than anything else is that loving presence of their fathers that, um, slow down enough to really see them get curious about their, their world. Um, and, and, you know, strip away the clutter of the everyday life. Mm -hmm. So, we can all do that, right? We can all find time to unplug for a weekend or even an afternoon to really drop in deeply with our, with our children. And that would be my invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Us. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I guess the other piece would be, uh, if listeners do want to get a hold of you, I know you shared the podcast and the website, but how can they get a hold of you directly if they wanted to? Yeah, you can just uh, lukeentrup.com. There's a they can uh, send me a message via my website. They can also give me a follow on Instagram, Luke Entrup on Instagram, and send me a DM there. Either is fine. Okay, awesome. I will put all of that in the show notes. So yeah, thank you again. This was great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for checking out this episode with Luke. As always, please leave a review or a comment in the comment section. I always love hearing from you. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or check out our sponsors. That's the best and easiest way to support this podcast. 
Thank you again. And until next week.